talking about the rupture doctrine, I'm sorry, the rapture theory, as we get right into it here today, and, um, and document. Now look, men say this and men say that. If you're going to follow Christ, follow what he says. And in this 13th chapter of Mark, he's telling us exactly, and I do mean precisely, in detail, how it will be at his coming. So, and never, you know, if I didn't believe Christ, I wouldn't even call myself a Christian. I really wouldn't. As he speaks, and then you will have some Christians that would say, well, this was not written to the church, brother. Well, Revelation 2.9 documents that it is written to the church. As a matter of fact, the only two churches that Christ found no fault with, that they would make it, teach this very thing. The delivering up before the spurious Messiah. So, hey, this is getting down where the rubber meets the road. And you've either got to make your mind up that you're going to follow Christ or men. The choice is yours. Traditions will always, most always, lead you astray from the true teachings of Christ unless you double check them in the word of God. And let God's word always rule over man got to do that. Now, we know that we have two bodies from 1 Corinthians 15, a spiritual and a flesh. And we know that um, we have to make a choice, and the choice is ours. We must either love our Father or Satan. There's a great controversy in this world. Some people, uh, especially in the Christian community, would say, stay away from controversy. Well, if you stay away from controversy and call yourself a Christian, you're not doing your work. Because the controversy is between Satan and, the, um, that is to say, the prince of the air and Jesus Christ. Make your choice, friend, and make your stand. Because Satan works overtime spiritually in the world today among humanism, the one-worlders, the new world order. Not to say that any of those things would be bad were it Christ... Uh, bringing in the kingdom, but no, he's trying to establish his own kingdom, and he certainly takes advantage of those that he can turn against the true Messiah through deception. And if you wish to listen to that stuff, then God will pile upon you the strong delusion that we read of in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So, if you're a Christian, these words of Christ in the 13th chapter of Mark tell you exactly. As a matter of fact, he gives seven things here and in, the, in Matthew chapter 24, and they're the seven trumpets. They're the seven seals. So you get a better picture of what's happening in the trumpets and the seals by understanding this chapter. This is how it's going to be. He stated in the closing statement in the last lecture, in the 17th verse of this 13th chapter, Woe to those that are with child when I return. Never has it been a sin in when God stated to man, replenish the earth, and um, uh, kind after kind, people after people. Never a sin to replenish the earth. That's why we were placed here. So we know then that he's speaking in a spiritual sense of his coming, expecting a virgin bride. Someone that has not slipped, someone that has not fell away to a spurious Messiah before he returns. And we pick it up then with the other signs of his coming and how it would be and what you should be watchful of. So, verse 18, let's ask, uh, 17, 18 rather, we ask a word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. It reads, And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. Well, what is it noted for when Christ returns? The harvest. Do you ever harvest in the winter? Of course not. The harvest around the world is either spring or uh, fall, whichever, which, whatever the crop may be. It's one or the other of those times. And what he's saying is that make sure that you know when the true harvest is and don't get harvested out of season by a spurious Messiah. Verse 19, For in those days shall be affliction, 
such as was not from the beginning. I want to read that to you again. In those days there shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time neither shall be. Now the word affliction here in the um, Greek is clipsis, clipsis, and, and it means tribulation. So if you're going to start your post-trib, mid-trib, or whatever trib you want, trib-trib, you better know first there's not just one tribulation. There are two. The first one is the tribulation, this affliction, a time that has never been like this, that is to say, after the false Messiah appears on this earth and deceives most of those people that are ready to flutterbug, all right? And unfortunately, they deserve it. I mean, they haven't read the word. The thlipsis means it will be used again as the tribulation of Christ. But most people overlook this simply because in English, a, a Greek word the same word was translated affliction rather than tribulation when basically even in English they're one and the same. Now a note of caution. Many so-called scholars of God's word, and note I said so-called because there are a lot of them that are only so-called, will tell you that this entire chapter, chapter 13 and Matthew of Mark and, and Matthew 24, came to pass when, uh, concerning the stones being toppled when the Roman general Titus rode into Jerusalem and finished it off basically and, um, and took captive and scattered, dispersed. If you... If you are a believer in your own father, and your father tells you that when this tribulation comes to pass, that it will be, um, it will be an affliction that has was not from such as was not from the beginning of the creation, and let some little Roman ten general pass it off when he didn't do anything, some of the the walls, the stones in the west wall still stand. Meaning what? It has not come to pass. So don't listen to so-called scholars that make things fit their own agenda. If it had been Titus, uh, if Titus had been this uh, false one that uh, God is speaking of, we would already be through the millennium because that was 2,000 years ago, 70 A.D., so, so don't, don't get caught up in um, uh, would-be um, prognosticators of God's word without checking them out in the simplicity in which Christ taught. Hey, these things that he is giving you as signs are very natural. Pray that your flight be not in the winter. That means don't be harvested out of season. Anybody that's ever done any harvesting knows that. That may be why that some of your so-called scholars miss the mark because they've never harvested anything other than maybe uh, shekels for their hire like hirelings usually do. So uh, Christ writes in a way that anyone can understand in that simplistic way. So don't be deceived. This is the first tribulation and these are the events that shall transpire as reported. God's elect would be delivered up. The church, that is to say. I'm going to call it the church. Because it will not accept this spurious Messiah. That's why Christ would write as he does in the next verse 20. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh. I want to reemphasize. No flesh flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Now what is he talking about? He's talking about the apostasy. Those that think they're going to load up on the first bus and flit out of here, uh, then uh, they're going to jump on the first bus that comes along, and unfortunately it's the wrong bus. 
and Christ makes it very plainly, if this first tribulation, that is to say the magnificence, and he is magnificent as far as deception goes, and as Daniel puts his arrival, that he comes in peacefully and prosperously, that is to say he's making it real good for everybody, claiming to be Savior, as Paul would say in 2 Thessalonians 2, standing in Mount Zion claiming to be Jesus. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet that we read of back in verse 14, the desolate tor standing where he ought not. That's when it happens and that's when the tribulation. His miracles will be so fantastic. They are supernatural. You haven't seen anything like it in your lifetime, but you're going to. Christ is good enough to us that he even lets us know what he shortened it to. From seven years to five months. That is written in Revelation chapter 9. Verse 21. And then if any man... Now I want you to note again, who did he tell you in, in verse... Um, uh, five, he warns you against deceiving you. Man, watch out for man and his traditions. Then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. Why? You're wise enough to know what happens when Christ returns. In the wink of an eye, at the seventh trump, we in the flesh bodies are instantly changed into our spiritual bodies. And when you see the big hero appear in this generation, it will happen, performing miracles that you've never heard of before even, then make sure that you pinch yourself if necessary to make sure you're still in the flesh because don't believe it. Don't believe man. Don't believe the man of perdition. Don't believe the man of sin. Believe your father and believe the Lord Jesus Christ or stop calling yourself a Christian. You will either believe the teachings of Jesus Christ or you might as well stop calling yourself a Christian. Believe him not. What does that say to you? That says to you that Christ is saying a false Christ shall come. No doubt about it. As a matter of fact, in the next verse, 22, for false Christ and false prophets shall, S-H-A-L-L, -L, not maybe, not perhaps, not if and when, shall, will, rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. I tell you this, the tricks that he can perform, like snapping fingers and lightning coming from heaven, Revelation 13, and many other things, it's going to be quite a show. And if you're not spiritually prepared with it, with God's truth in your mind, the teachings of Jesus Christ, the real gospel, I'm sorry, you'll probably be very impressed. And it would be too late to teach you at that time, so you better get into your Father's Word now as to how we will actually gather back to Him. That's important. Verse 22, 23 rather. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you all things, all things that you need to know to not be deceived, and to understand the true returning of Christ. He's told you. And if you're deceived, I'm sorry, you haven't read the letter that he's written to you. Some of you have eyes to see and ears to hear and thank God for you. The rest, it doesn't matter. It does matter in a sense or we wouldn't be teaching. But we'll teach them later. Don't worry. Verse 24. But in those days... After that tribulation, what tribulation? The first one, the tribulation of the false Christ and the false prophets. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Why? Because of the brightness of the return of Christ will far overshadow it. 25. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. 26. 
and then shall they see the Son of Man coming. And then only will you see Christ coming after the false Christ, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Now, fantastic that he appears, but he is with us through the comforter, through this whole thing. As a matter of fact, remember the ninth verse that told you, don't even premeditate what you're saying. The comforter will speak through you. Verse 27, And then, and then only, shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. The four winds that are written of in Revelation chapter 7, the four winds, spirits, ruach, that hold, if you would, the end from taking place, Christ's return, until the exact moment. Daniel chapter 7, the four winds determine. In Ezekiel chapter 37, when Ezekiel was ordered to prophesy to those dead bones, which simply means a bunch of dead heads, spiritually dead, God said, preach to them. And what do you see? Some of them began to move around. There again, the four winds at that time. The four winds are always present when we discuss uh, the end of this dispensation. What a time that's going to be. Well, will it be frightening and rough? Not at all. Hey, bring it on. It's exciting. We're anxious. Well, what about that hour of temptation? I don't think you find Satan tempting. They will because he's performing miracles, making great promises, paying all their bills, because he comes in peacefully and prosperously. They're going to love him, especially when he says, I, I am him. I'm the anointed one. I love you so much. You know, most Christians picture Satan as an old boy with horns wearing red long handle underwear and a pitchfork. They're going to be all out of gear and strip a cog when they see this dude coming. He's beautiful. Most beautiful of the archangels. It's written in Ezekiel 28. I don't know. Did Jesus say he would come first? Absolutely. He has declared it. It is in the trumps. It is in the seals. It is in the vials of Revelation. But people like to deceive. Men like to sell short. Verse 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. He didn't say maybe. Learn it. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. What summer? Not winter. It's harvest. This happened in the year of our Lord, 1948. And some believe 67, the Six-Day War. Be that as it may, it was when Judah, even along with the bad figs, Jeremiah 24, returned to Jerusalem. 29. So ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. That is to say, Christ returned. That was the question in the beginning. When are these things going to be? 30. Verily I say unto you that this generation, this is important, this generation, what generation? Of the fig tree, 1948, shall not pass till all these things be done. That's a specific time. Hey, nobody knows the hour or the moment, but the elect know the season. 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. This word. This earth age and this heaven age will end. The hourglass is tilted. The times of sand are dripping out. But this earth will be forever, and God's word is forever. The question is, will you be a part of it? Do you believe Jesus Christ or do you believe men? I don't know. That's your choice. You will live with it. Verse 32. But of that day and in that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Only he knows the instant. Take, 33, take ye heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is. You know the season, you know what's going to be happening, and you know in what generation. 34, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. 
who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. Do you have a work? It disappoints me when a Christian says, I wonder what I'm supposed to do. This, he's telling you to stand, not to fly, but to put the gospel armor on and stand against the fiery darts of Satan when he comes to deceive your brothers and sisters. That's work. Do it and commanded the porter to watch. That's why uh, when he took a far journey and comes back and finds her with child and given suck, what does that mean? Okay, got it? 35, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh. At even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Which will it be? 36, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. The death penalty is for those that go to sleep on watch in a combat zone. 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto you all, unto all, watch. That's what watchmen are. Well, what am I supposed to do? Watch. Watch by the word. The signs given. The third, 24th chapter of Matthew goes into it with a little more specific. Said it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage. Well, who were they giving and taking marriage to on Noah's time? The fallen angels. Revelation 12, 7, Satan and his angels are kicked out on this earth. They're going to be with him. Oh, what a day of jubilee it will be for some, for they will think it is the true Christ. Do you know that God teaches against those that would do any other way than to put the gospel armor on and stand? He doesn't like it when ministers of so-called his word teach people to run. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 16. God knew 500 years before Christ walked the earth that people would be teaching flyaway doctrine. He taught against it. He said, I am against it. Ezekiel 13, verse 16, To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. He comes in peacefully and prosperously, but it's the most um, soul-stricken time in history. Satan claiming to be Jesus, and so-called Christians whoring after him the great mystery babble and the harlot that, that those that really believe in Christ and don't know that the Antichrist is Antichrist, Spirit's Messiah is Spirit's Messiah instead of Christ. 17, likewise thou son of man, set thy face against, I repeat, not for, against the daughters of thy people which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. Bear in mind Margaret MacDonald, the daughter. Sons do it too. She started it. 18. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women which that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. They're doing what? Hunting souls. Are you saved? Will you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that come unto you? You see, there's only one Savior and God's mocking them a bit. Now, you're going to have to trust me. You with um, Strong's Concordances can come pretty close to it. But I want to tell you what the Hebrew manuscripts say in this. God says, you know, do you know what a pillow is? Okay, a pillow, you always put a covering over it and it conceals something. And the Hebrew word utilized here means concealed, sewing to conceal. And all armholes should be every joint. And what he's saying is, you sew coverings to hide every joint of my outreaching hands to my children and promise a different way of salvation. He doesn't like it. He never said, I'll fly you away. He never said that. He said the false Christ will come and then the true Christ will come and we will gather to him. 
and then some that are not familiar with the Greek language in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 think that the air, which is our in the Greek means, which actually in fact means the spiritual body change at the seventh trump. And they get all knocked out of socket and teach people to fly to save their souls. God doesn't like it. 19. And will you pollute me among my people, my truth, for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. Amazing thing to me. It really is. God doesn't like for people to lie. Many times it's done innocently because they simply do not, with a scholarly look, scrutinize the Word of God prayerfully with understanding, but listen to men. Christ has already told you, men will do it to you, friend. If you don't believe men will do it to you, talk to a woman sometime. And you'll find out what, how men are. And I know that may upset some, but hey, let's get it right down where the rubber meets the road. That's the way men are. They'll do anything for a handful of money. I want to go where the easy money, a bunch of harlings. There's nothing wrong with a servant of God taking a salary. But there are some that do it. All higher critics are people that are paid to try to destroy or discredit, I should say, discredit, I'll soften it, the word of God. And people eat it up. They don't know the difference. Verse 20. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against. Did he say for? I am against your pillows. That's your concealment of truth, your coverings. Wherewith you there hunt the souls to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms. And will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. And friend, it just won't fly. I cannot believe that there are ministers that tell their congregation, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You don't have to understand all this letter of God, from God. Just believe and be saved. Who? By Satan? The false Christ? Are you going to lead them to them? And let me tell you something, individual. Anytime a man or person tells you you don't have to read God's word, mark that person because they are a false teacher, preacher, prophet. They're a liar. Because the very word revelation means the unveiling or the revealing of God's truth. And they're covering it. Covered it like a tumble bug under a cow pile. That's the way they operate. Concealment. All in beautiful. Oh, dear God, you just don't have to listen to God. Listen to me. Just believe and be saved and live forever. If, you know, the Bible would be a very short uh, book if that were true. Do you think that your father had time to waste that he brought all these truths to tell you how you do attain salvation? You, what did he tell you to do? Put on the gospel armor. All of it. Understand what the gospel armor is. And you put it on and it's got a special little skyrocket suit and you get here and you get in your chair and get all set and when the whistle blows on the seventh trump, you pull that sucker and you're gone. Is that what it said? I don't think so. It said, stand. I don't think you'll find a rocket mentioned anywhere in the gospel armor. And the gospel armor is not to fight against men today, but it's to fight against. Ephesians chapter 6, principalities in high places. That means Satan and his little angels. I don't know. Are you a Christian or do you just play act? Do you just mouth the word Christian and listen to men rather than the teachings of Almighty God that teach you to fly to save your soul and God says, I am against it. 
Well, dear brother, I never heard that before. I can tell you why. You never read the Word of God. And you come up short. I say that in love, but firmness. Tough love, you bet. I don't want to see you go to hell. I don't want to see you suffer the shame of having worshipped the false Messiah and listening to scholars that don't know come Sikkim. Come here from Sikkim. I am against those that teach my people to fly to save their souls when they got work to do right here. Book of Matthew 24, the sister and companion chapter to uh, Mark 13 that we just completed there. He said there will be two working in the field. The subject and object in the Greek is the coming of Antichrist. And one's going to be taken by the Antichrist, of course. That's the subject. And people today will say, oh, praise God, I want to be the first one taken. Taken by Antichrist? Wake up. You either believe the teachings of Christ or you're not a Christian. Read it for yourself. Don't be deceived by men that would teach you to fly to hunt your soul. Because they can't save your soul. Only Christ can. And the Antichrist, which is properly translated from the Greek, instead of Jesus, would just love to try. How would you? You want to hop in bed with him? Have to it, friend. Just keep listening to, to uh, storytellers. And you'll be in bed with the false messiah. Because he comes long before the true Christ does. A full five months. Okay, let's continue on with the next verse, 21. Your kerchiefs, your little concealment claws that you sew and weave your lies over the word of God, telling people you don't have to know it. Also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. And you shall know that I am the Lord. 22. You know, that's when he's going to say, they'll come up and say, Oh yes, we've been sewing and just tittle-tattling along here and been doing your work and talking about demons and cussing out them old mean demons and just doing your work. Jesus, get out of my sight. Teaching my people to fly to save their souls. I never knew you. It's going to happen, friend. 22. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous one, I say, sad. Whom I have not made sad and strengthened the hands of the wicked, the wicked one, Satan, by helping him out. That he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life, eternal life. Just believe, that's all. Be saved, that's all. You don't have to understand Revelation. That's all. That should be when you would say, that's all. 23. Therefore, you shall see no more vanity. That's empty lies. Nor divine divination. That's men lying about religion and salvation. For I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. That is the purpose, and what a sad day that's going to be when they begin to pray for the mountains to fall on them because many of them innocently, because they've been taught that this stuff, that's what all it is, is stuff. And they teach it in ignorance of the simplicity of the true gospel of Jesus Christ and his return to the church, yes, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, and Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Documents what the true churches will be teaching concerning the synagogue of Satan and the Kenites that claim to be our brother Judah, that you hold to the line and understand the spurious Messiah that sits in that synagogue. Who, tell me this, who would play God in the synagogue, synagogue of Satan, as it is written in Revelation 2.9? That's like asking who's in Grant's tomb. Use it. You've got it. You've got gray matter up here. Have the seal of God in your forehead, which is to say the truth of God, and Satan can't tempt you. you rather find him very disgusting. Your people are hurting. You want to know what a Christian is supposed to do? 
serve God and be ready. That day is coming. Some of you have eyes to see and ears to hear and you have known there was more to God's word than you had been taught. Well, praise God, there's one way that you can learn. That's to get in his word. I do not say these things nor read God's word to offend anyone, but to truly unveil and uncover his truly saving hands and to prepare you for that moment in love that is about to transpire. For the events as stated in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, those signs consummate the end of this age. You're living in it. What part are you going to play? You could, there's two sides. It's real easy to make your mind up. If you're going to be on the side of the Lord, listen to His word, not men's words. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please?